This chapter about supply and demand and market equilibrium is the most important chapter that you ever study in economics. It talks about why we buy what we buy, what causes us to buy more of something, why sellers sell what they sell, what causes them to want to sell more or less of a good or service, and then how those two things play together to create that market equilibrium price and the market equilibrium quantity that's bought or sold. This just gives us an overview for the chapter. We're going to cover all of this in great detail. So a market is any interaction between buyers and sellers. It could be your local grocery store, it could be the New York Stock Exchange. It could be a garage sale, as well as international trade. So it's only by the interaction of buyers and sellers where we can discover what price is going to be. People think that sellers can just sell their goods or service for any price they want to. That's not really true. They have to sell their products at a price that people are willing to pay in order to be able to make a profit. So the demand schedule, we're gonna start the first half of the chapter just thinking on the demand side. So when we think on the demand side, we're thinking like we always do. We're usually, those of us who don't own businesses, are just thinking like consumers, like buyers. So on the demand side, we're asking how much will buyers buy at all the various prices? So there'll be a schedule, which looks like a table or an XY chart you might have learned in middle school, and we'll use the data in the table to construct our demand curve, to construct that graph. So when we're constructing this information, we're making that ceteris paribus assumption that we talked about in chapter one. We're gonna let price change and see how much quantity changes, and we'll assume that nothing else is changing. And then as we move through this demand chart, this demand information, we'll begin to think about what causes the demand to change other than price. So the law of demand says other things equal, as prices rise, people won't buy as much. Or if prices fall, people will buy more. That makes sense. Don't you want to buy more when price goes down? And less when price goes up. So price is an obstacle to buyers. So we like for that obstacle to be as low as possible. We want prices to be low. So there's some reasons behind that. So let's think about the reasons behind it. I'm going to start with income effect because it's the most logical. We just have so much money to spend, just so much income. So when price comes down, we can simply afford more of it. So the income effect just makes sense to us. As price comes down, our income stretches further, we can buy more of the good. The substitution effect says, well, if the price of this good that we're talking about is coming down, I'll buy more of this one instead of what would now be a more expensive substitute. Maybe I was buying beef before, but I really wanted chicken. But if the price of chicken comes down, then I could buy more chicken instead of beef. So when the price of one of the goods comes down, we'll substitute into buying more of that good. The last one that's well, it's listed first here, but the last as we're talking about it, is the law of diminishing marginal utility. So utility, remember from chapter one, that meant happiness or satisfaction. And marginal, also from chapter one, we learned meant additional or extra. And diminishing, you know, means it's declining. So the law of diminishing marginal utility says as we get more and more units of a good, the only way you can convince us to keep buying that is to lower the price. So let's think about law of diminishing marginal utility. If you were really, really hungry, and so you stopped and you got a large pizza for supper on the way home from work, and you sat down with your Dr. Pepper and you, whatever you like to eat, drink with your pizza, 
and you had the first bite of the first slice, wouldn't it just be delicious because you were so hungry and you finally got to have that first bite? And so you'll probably even have a second piece of pizza because you were really hungry. But compare that second piece to that first piece. How good was it? Well, it was good, but it probably wasn't as good as that first bite. And then the third or fourth or fifth slice of pizza, each additional unit we get gives us less and less satisfaction. That's the diminishing marginal utility. My economics professor, when I was in school 100 years ago, used to talk about sunshiny days in, say, March versus sunshiny days in August. In March, we get a bright, sunshiny day, and we all want to go out and enjoy it. And in August, we get so many sunshiny days, and we all want to run in to the air conditioning and stay out of the sunshiny day. So when we first get something, that gives us a lot of utility. But additional units of the same thing do not give us as great a utility. Shoe stores understand this a lot. Many times when you go into a shoe store, somebody will greet you at the door with the words, it's buy one, get one half off today, meaning you only went in there for the one pair of shoes, but they're gonna try to get you to buy more by giving you a discount in the price on the second pair. So that downward sloping demand curve we're gonna see is gonna show us that people buy more as price goes down. And the reason for that is these three reasons. So here's our first demand curve. Here's the schedule on the left, that table we talked about. It shows us some various prices, and then it shows the quantity demanded, QD, quantity demanded at those various prices. So at a price of $5, the quantity demanded of this good, and it's just pretend information to give you an idea of how to construct this, the book is using corn for an individual, but whatever the good is, you see as price goes down from five to four, the quantity demanded by this person, this individual, goes up from 10 to 20. If the price goes down from four to three, then instead of buying 20, they wanna buy 35 of it. Instead of, when, it goes, when the price goes down to three to two, instead of buying 35, they wanna buy 50. And then when the price is $1, they want to buy 80. I don't know if these are ears of corn or bushels of corn. Seems like a lot. Um, but whatever the good is, as price goes down, people will buy more of it. That's what I want you to get from this. And then we move from the schedule, the table at the left, to actually plotting those data, data points on the graph. In economics, price is always going to be on the vertical axis. Hear me say that again. Price is always gonna be on the vertical axis and quantity will be on the horizontal axis. That part won't change. Economists are not careful about independent and dependent variables. Instead, they're just very consistent. So price is gonna be on the vertical and quantity on the horizontal and don't make any assumptions behind that about what might be de dependent or independent. All right, so we're gonna graph these data points. So at a price of five, there's a quantity of 10. So we go over to a price of five and down to the quantity of 10 and make our first data point. Then graph the rest of these and connect the dots and we have this individual's demand curve. We can move from the and jet Eating corn causes cancer, then we would expect that demand curve not to shift out to increase demand, we'd expect it to shift left to decrease demand. That's a change in consumer taste and preferences. Some new report, report came out and says corn cures cancer, not causes but cures. Well then that would shift our demand curve from D1 to D2, shifting out demand change in the number of buyers. If a company does a, a successful ad campaign, let's think maybe not a company, but uh, an entire industry, like the Got Milk campaign. Do you remember all the ads we used to see about Got Milk just trying to um, increase the consumption of milk for all dairy farmers? Well, that would increase the number of buyers and shift that demand curve to the right increasing the demand at all possible prices, 
if the if the ad campaign was successful, it would increase the number of people wanted to buy, the quantity demanded. A change in income will also shift the demand curve to the right or to the left. But we have to know if the good is a normal good or an inferior good. So a normal good is defined as a good that as people's incomes go up, they want to buy more of it. That's true for most of the stuff that we buy. If I'm talking about tickets to the Rangers game, as income goes up, people will want to buy more of that. So if national income goes up, that would be good for the Rangers. They would sell more tickets, perhaps. An inferior good, on the other hand, is a good that as income goes up, people will buy less of. An inferior good is a good that as income goes up, people will buy less of. So think about what is a good that you buy simply because that's all you can afford right now. But if your income went up, you wouldn't purchase that anymore. So you're kind of thinking like, if I won the lottery, what would I not buy anymore? So when people think about inferior goods, they usually think about things like ramen noodles. Maybe that's what a college student buys at the moment because it's a fairly cheap food source. And so they eat ramen noodles now while they're in school and maybe not uh, working full time or whatever. Ramen noodles, bologna, spam, uh, used clothes at Goodwill, bus service, those kinds of things are things usually people think of when my income goes up, I'm not going to buy as min much of this. So if it's an inferior good and income goes up, then the demand for that good would shift left, would decrease. As income goes up, we wouldn't buy as much. So the demand for that good would shift left. It would decrease. On the flip side, if income goes down, then the demand for that good would go up because people would suddenly not be able to afford. If, if national incomes were going down, then maybe we would all be eating more bologna or ramen noodles or Spam. These are more determinants of demand. So a change in the price of related goods depends on how the goods might be related. They could be complements or they could be uh, substitutes. So substitutes are things you already understand. Just think of two goods that are substitutes. Let's do Coke and Pepsi. Well, if I'm drawing a graph for Coke, and now you have to focus on what am I, what, what am I actually drawing the graph for? If I'm drawing the graph for Coca-Cola and the price of Pepsi goes way down, would you expect people to buy more Coke or less Coke? Well, the price of Pepsi went down, so some people who view Coke and Pepsi as substitutes will then not buy as much Coke, they'll buy more Pepsi. So if I was graphing Coca-Cola, then can you see the demand for Coca-Cola would shift left because people are now buying more Pepsi. Complements are different. These are not things that you've probably thought about before. Complementary goods are goods that are used together. So like um, cars and gasoline. If the price of gasoline goes way up, what do you think happens to the demand for a gas guzzling SUV or big pickup truck or whatever, a big user of gasoline? So if gas prices go to $5 a gallon, what do you think will happen to F-350 pickup trucks? Do you think that they will sell more pickup trucks when gas prices are very high or less? So if I'm graphing pickup trucks, and gas prices go, I mean, like an F-350, if gas prices go up to $5 a gallon, then people are going to buy less. So the demand curve for those big pickup trucks would begin to shift left. Uh, other complementary goods. In the old days, we'd use the example of cameras and film. Those new um, remakes of those Polaroid cameras now where you put the film in and you get the picture back in just a few seconds. I don't know if you've seen those, but the cameras and the film go together. So if the price of the film goes way up, can you see that we'll probably sell less cameras? If the price of the film goes down, we'll sell more cameras. 
So we're shifting that demand curve to the right if demand is increasing and to the left if demand is decreasing. The last determinant of demand is a change in consumer expectations. So if I told you that tomorrow gas prices were going to go way up, what would you do today? Well, you'd run down and fill your car up with gas. Well, gas prices didn't change. I just changed your expectation about the future price, and that caused you to change your demand for the good today. Um, we also do that with changes in our income, with the stimulus packages that came out this year or any other expected change in our income. Say you get worried about being, being laid off. If you get worried about being laid off, do you spend as much as you would normally? No, you start saving. And so your demand for certain goods will begin to shift to the left because you're worried about your future income. So this gives you a really good overview of all five, there are five determinants of demand. Change in buyer's taste and preferences, change in the number of buyers. Remember when it's change in income, you have to know if it's a normal good or an inferior good. And when it's a change in the price of related goods, you have to know is it a substitute good or a complementary good. Complement. And then the fifth one was change in consumer expectations. If any one of these things changes, then the demand curve would shift to the right or shift to the left. It would not be a change in price that caused that. It's that at all possible prices, people wanted to buy more, so the demand curve shifted to the right, or at all possible prices, people wanted to buy less, so the curve would shift to the left. Now, we finished with the demand side. That's how we normally think because we're normally consumers. Let's look at the supply side. So when we think on the supply side, we're thinking like producers. We're thinking like the owners of the company. So on the supply side, we're looking to see at all possible prices, how much will producers want to supply and make available for sale? So we'll have that same supply schedule, just like we had the demand schedule, but instead of quantity demanded, now it will be quantity supplied. And that supply schedule will be what we graph onto the supply curve. So this is the amount producers are willing and able to sell at any given price. We'll also could have an individual supply, but in this class we're always working so remember the law of demand said as price goes down, consumers, buyers will want to buy more of it. And as price goes up, consumers or buyers would want to buy less of it. Well, that was fine for the law of demand, but the law of supply is thinking from the producer's perspective. If you had the company, would you want to be able to sell at a high price or a low price? Well, you'd like to get the highest price possible, right? Because that would mean more revenue. So the law of supply says, as prices rise, the quantity supplied rises. And as price falls, the quantity supplied will fall. So that's a different slope to the supply curve because now price and quantity supplied goes up at the same time. It's a direct relationship. And price and if uh, price falls, then quantity supplied falls. So we have a direct relationship for the supply curve. So here's an individual supply curve just like we started with an individual demand curve. So at a price of five, this particular firm, this one company, will supply 60 units. See how that says quantity S, quantity supplied now. The other was QD for quantity demanded. So the quantity supplied at a price of five, this firm will supply 60 units. At a price of four, they'll supply 50 units, three, 35, etc. And so that information is graphed over here. At a price of five, then the firm will supply 60 units. At a price of four, the firm will supply 50. So we see an upward sloping, a direct relationship for the supply curve. The demand curve had a downward sloping an in, uh, inverse relationship between price and quantity.
think about this. So a change in taxes and subsidies. Well, taxes are something that the business has to pay. So an increase in our taxes is a bad thing, right? But subsidies is money that they get from the government, from the government to the business. So an increase in my subsidies, like to milk producers, would be a good thing to me. So let's, let's review that. So if we have an increase in our taxes, that's money from the business to the government, that's bad. We'd shift our supply curve from S1 to S3. That would be a decrease in supply. But if we have an increase in our subsidies, that's good. So we'd be increasing supply because that would increase our profitability from S1 to S2. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. How would the curve shift if you had a decrease in taxes? Right, if you had a decrease in taxes, that would be a good thing for the company and so they would increase their supply curve. If you had a decrease in your subsidies, that would be a bad thing and we would decrease our subsidies. So a change in the price of other, and you really should put in there production goods, substitute production goods. It's easier to understand. So if you're thinking of substitute production goods, you're looking for a company that produces more than one thing. For example, the company Wilson, I think that's Wilson. Yeah, I'm going with that. That makes all the different kinds of athletic balls. They make soccer balls and basketballs and tennis balls and um, golf balls and a, a million others, right? They have a lot of different production goods. So can you see if the price of let's say basketballs is going up, then it might become more profitable to make basketballs and then produce less soccer balls maybe and produce more basketballs. So if the price of a substitute production good changes, then the company will respond and produce more or less of a different good that might not be as profitable to produce. And then lastly, just like the last thing on the demand curve was a change in consumer expectations. The last thing to affect the supply curve is a change in producer expectations. So let's say you've opened um, your restaurant and you were thinking about expanding and opening a different restaurant. Can you see a change in your expectations? Like what if the news media began to talk about the coming recession? If we were going down into a recession and so people weren't going to be buying, uh, spending as much money as they had been before, then if a producer begins to expect that, then he cuts back rather than expands. So you wouldn't continue to expand your restaurant. You would um, maybe even cut back on what you were offering already. So a producer changes their supply based on what they expect to happen in the market. So here is your summary of all your supply shifters, just like we had that summary for demand shifters. A change in resource prices, change in technology, taxes and subsidies, price of um, Substitute production goods, change in the number of suppliers, and then that change in the producer expectations. So now we're going to talk about market equilibrium, bringing the supply curve and the demand curve together. Okay, so remember that the demand curve sloped downward and the supply curve sloped upwards. So when we put the demand curve and the supply curve on one graph, we're going to see that they will intersect. And where the demand and the supply curve intersect is called equilibrium. Equilibrium is the idea that there's no incentive for change. It's balanced. It's at rest. So when we have an equilibrium, it tends to stay there for a while. Price will, will be at that price. If 
sellers are trying to charge a price higher than equilibrium, then buyers are not going to buy that higher price and a surplus will begin to develop, and meaning that the product is on store shelves gathering dust. Or if the price is the seller is setting it below what the equilibrium price would be, then we all go out and we buy it real quick and there's a shortage of it because the price is lower than what we were expecting it to be. So at equilibrium price and quantity, we won't have a surplus or a shortage. So when we're at that equilibrium, we'll be um, efficient. We'll be at the efficient allocation. So let's think about what efficiency means. So productive efficiency is producers producing their goods in the least costly way. Why would a producer want to produce in the least costly way? Because when they produce their good or service in the least costly way, it gives them the most amount of profit. So producing their goods and services in the least costly way doesn't mean making cheap products. Uh, even if you're making a Maserati or some really fancy car, you've got to hit the luxury level that your buyers expect for the product. But whatever that level of luxury might be, you still want to produce it in the least costly way, even at that high level of luxury. So producers are always seeking productive efficiency. I'm not saying we always achieve it. Obviously, we don't, but that's a goal, productive efficiency, to use the right mix of the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability, the resources, and the best technology that's the most profitable for that industry or for that company. Allocative efficiency talks about the right mix of goods and services to produce. Remember when we talked about consumer sovereignty? So consumers are king, consumers are deciding what gets produced, and if you're not producing what consumers want to buy, then consumers are going to ignore your product and you won't be making a profit and you'll go out of business. So allocative efficiency assumes that businesses are paying attention to what consumers want to buy and producing the right mix of goods and services. We don't want all Maseratis, right? I can't afford that. So we also need the Kias of the world or whatever, lower end car. We want a mix of goods and services so we get exactly what it is that consumers will want to buy. All right, so here's our equilibrium. I told you when you put the demand curve and the supply curve on one graph, you'd see where they intersect. So where do the curves intersect on this graph? Well, they intersect at a price of $3 and a quantity of 7,000. So it's easy to see where they cross on a graph and know our equilibrium price and quantity. But what if you don't have the graph? What if you have the two schedules? Notice on the left, you have the demand schedule. You can tell that because it's got a QD and as prices go down, quantity goes up. And on the right, you have the supply schedule. You can tell that by the QS. So as prices go down, Quantity goes down, quantity supplied goes down. So look at these two schedules and don't look at the graph and tell me where equilibrium is. Well, at a price of five, the quantity demanded is 2,000 and supplied is 12,000. Nope, that's not equilibrium. As a matter of fact, we're supplying 12,000 and only buying two. 12 minus two, there's a 10,000 unit surplus. Surplus meaning more is supplied than demanded. At a price of four, the quantity supplied is 10 and the demand is four. So there's still a surplus of 6,000 units. At a price of three, quantity demanded is 7,000. Quantity supplied is 7,000. There's our equilibrium, ding, ding, ding. We found it from the two schedules. At a price of three, there's no surplus no shortage, that's our equilibrium. If the price though were $2, I'm sorry, then the demand is 11,000 and the supply is only four. So producers are only making 4,000, but people wanna buy 11. Can you see that's a 7,000 unit shortage? Because the de demand is greater than the supply, so that's a shortage. 
At a price of one, people want to buy 16,000. The demand is 16, but firms only want to supply 1,000. So the demand of 16 and the supply of one, we have a 15,000, 15,000 unit shortage. So you need to be able to see the surplus and the shortages and the equilibrium, both from the graph or just from the two charts, if, that, if that's the information that you have. So prices are rationing the goods and services. Does that make sense to you? So I can't afford the price of the Maserati, so I'm not going to get a Maserati, right? It's rationing the good or service. I didn't get it. Somebody else will who could afford the Maserati. That won't be me. Although we know that you have to be willing and able to purchase it, right? I'm not able. I'm not sure I'd be willing even if I were able. I'm not even sure they make Maseratis anymore. I'm kind of old. That used to be an expensive car. All right. So this just gives you something to practice with. So in our graph at the left, we've got an equilibrium. You see the supply and the demand are intersect, intersecting. So we can see, in, they don't have a number here, but we can see where the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity would be. If we have an increase in demand, then notice that the price goes up and the quantity goes up. So I want you to think about this. Let's just talk for a minute. I wish you were here in class with me and we could really talk. But as the price, as the, I'm sorry, as the demand shifts to the right, that's an increase in demand. What could cause that? Well, we need to think back to our five demand shifters. Do you remember what they were? Change in taste and preferences, change in the number of buyers, change in the price of related goods, change in income, consumer expectations. So think about how one of those could change that caused that increase in demand. Would that be an increase or a decrease in the number of buyers? Everybody shouts at once, increase. Good job, that's an increase in the number of buyers. Would that be an increase in income if it was a normal good or an inferior good? Well, if it's shifting to the right, I heard everybody say normal good because if we had an increase in income and we had an increase in demand, that's a normal good. Let's see, what was one of the others? Change in taste and preferences. Did something favorable change or unfavorable to cause the demand curve to shift to the right? It had to be a favorable change because it made us want to buy more. So the good cures cancer or some such thing. Okay, so an increase in demand shifts the demand curve to the right, that increased price, and it increased the quantity demanded. Increase the demand. See, price goes up, quantity goes up. See the PQ with the arrows up? P means price, Q means quantity. So an increase in demand increases price, increases quantity. I really don't want you to memorize that. I really want you to draw the graph Draw the second demand curve, whether it's going to the right or going to the left, and then look to see what happened to price, what happened to quantity. All right, here's a decrease in demand. So now the demand curve was D3, and it shifted left to D4. Ooh, what could cause that decrease in demand? Hmm. So consumer taste and preferences. Did something favorable or unfavorable happen? Or well, it had to be unfavorable. People bought less. Yeah, causes cancer or something. Did the number of buyers go up or go down? Well, there had to be fewer buyers because the market demand went down. Um, let's do, we didn't do price of related goods a while ago. So let's say this is a substitute. So this is what we're graphing here. Let's say it's Coca-Cola. Did the price of Pepsi go up or down? Remember, we're graphing Coca-Cola, and it went from D3 to D4, so the price of Pepsi had to go down, right? Because now people are buying more Pepsi, and they're buying less Coke, so it went from D3 to D4. Getting the general idea? So a decrease in demand, notice that price went down, and the quantity went down. 
So here's our equilibrium again. So we have an equilibrium price. Now what's going to happen? Oh, did they not show us our second? There it is. Our second supply curve. So S1 to S2. That's an increase in supply. S1 to S2. What could have caused that increase in supply? Think about your determinants of supply. So this time it was a change in resource prices, or a change in number of suppliers, or changes in taxes and subsidies, a uh, change in the price of a substitute production goods, changes in producer expectations. I feel like I left one out. Y'all have to go back and see which one I might have left out. So S1 to S2, increase in supply. Was it that something happened that was good for the supplier or bad? It had to be a good thing because he's supplying more. So did his resource prices go up or go down? Resource prices must have gone down because that makes his cost go down. That makes his profitability go up, so he supplies more. Change in the number of suppliers? There must be more suppliers because we're supplying more of the good. Uh, change in producer expectations. He must have been expecting something positive because he's producing more. I'm talking just about the graph on the left, just the increase in supply. I wish the other one hadn't shown up yet. So when we do have on the graph at the left, the increase in supply, that S1 to S2, notice what happened to price. Price goes down and quantity supplied goes up. Price goes down and quantity supplied went up. Remember, as you go away from zero, out the horizontal or up the vertical axis, the numbers get bigger. So S1 to S2 price, that price is going down. But those Q, that, those quantities, are going up. All right, let's look at the graph on the right. So cover up the one on the left. Look at the graph just on the right. Now we have S3 to S4. That's a decrease in supply. So let's do this one with taxes and subsidies. We didn't talk about that a while ago. So did this, uh, in the industry that's on the right, where we go from S3 to S4, did taxes go up or did taxes go down? Well, they supplied less, so something bad happened. So it must have been that taxes went up, caused S3 to go to S4. So when taxes went up and S3 shifted to S4, we're going to supply less. What happened to prices? Well, look at the new intersection point. So prices went up. And what happened to quantity? Well, quantity is now going down. So when you're shifting this curve, well, really before you shift the curve, when you draw your first supply and your first demand, label that price P1, that quantity Q1, then draw your second curve, whatever changed, the supply curve or the demand curve, Find where those intersect, label that P2 and Q2 so you can tell yourself what happened to price, what happened to quantity. You're not going to have to deal with complex cases in your homework or even on your test. But if both supply and demand changed, at the same time, then there's going to be something that you don't know. And when you don't know it, it's indeterminate. This is more than I want to do with you um, when we can't be in the classroom together. But you just, you can think about if the supply goes up and the demand goes up at the same time, so supply up and demand up at the same time. That's going to be line three here. When the demand goes up, that's going to show prices going up. But when the supply goes up, that's going to show prices going down. So we really are not going to know what the effect is on price because they're not telling us how much supply goes up or how much demand goes up. But in both of those cases, the quantity goes up. So that's why they're saying something's indeterminate. 
if both the supply and the demand curves are changing, then either price or quantity will be indeterminate. So let's think about price ceilings and price floors. So sometimes the government doesn't let prices go to equilibrium. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the government will interfere with the market and not let the decisions of buyers and the decisions of sellers create a market equilibrium. So a price ceiling. So a price ceiling is the government saying, we're not going to let the price go all the way up to the equilibrium. We're going to set a ceiling price, a maximum price, lower than what market equilibrium would, would normally be. You know that anytime price is below equilibrium, we learned that would create a shortage. So when the government sets price ceilings and doesn't let price go up to the equilibrium, that creates a shortage. Long ago and far away, actually it was here, but when I was first studying economics, we had an oil crisis that caused gasoline, an oil crisis that caused gasoline prices to go way up. And people started saying the government needs to protect us. And so the government stepped in and set a price ceiling and it caused a terrible shortage for gasoline. And they even started, the government set some rationing in place. They said, well, you can only buy gasoline if you're license plate on your car ends in an even number, you can buy it on even number days, or if it ends in an odd number, you can buy it on odd number days. It was a very bad thing. It set, it caused such a shortage in gasoline. So price ceilings are something that the government does to try to protect, to try to keep us from going up to a what might seem like an unreasonably high price, but it does cause shortages. So the equilibrium price in this graph is 350, but the price ceiling, the PC, the price ceiling is always set below equilibrium. It's the government saying this is the ceiling, you can't go up to that equilibrium price. And you can see the shortage here that it would create. Sometimes the government steps into the marketplace not to set a price ceiling, but to set a price floor. So this time the price would be set above equilibrium. Normally the prices would go down to that equilibrium, but the government steps in and says, no, we're going to set this price floor above equilibrium and you cannot uh, set a price lower than that. So the classic example of a price floor is a minimum wage. There are a lot of people who would be willing to work for less than minimum wage, but the government says, no, you have to pay this wage. You cannot let that price of that labor go down to the equilibrium. Anytime you have a price, you're going to get a surplus. So when we think about this with respect to minimum wage, the supply curve is the number of people willing to work, and the demand curve is the jobs available. So you would see that there would be a surplus of people willing to work versus those that are actually going to be hired at that higher wage. So if the price was allowed to go to equilibrium, there would be more people actually working, is the argument for the minimum wage. So the last words are all very interesting. So you might find this one interesting with student loans and tuition costs. So we know subsidies mean money from the government to either a business, but in this case, into students. So it's interesting to see how much that tuition costs have, have risen just over this time period. Just look from 2017, 2018, uh, or to look from 1971 to 2017. Oh, that's a huge increase, isn't it? So I want you to spend a lot of time looking at these demand and supply curves. They're just pivotal to all study, pivotal 
to all study of economics. So please take some time, go back through this uh, presentation as often as you need to and work and rework those homework problems so that you can see which way the demand and the supply curves are gonna shift and what effect that's gonna have on price and what effect that's gonna have on quantity. Have a great day, thank you.